The Minnesota House Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice Reform for the 92nd Legislative Session will come to order. The clerk will take the roll. Chair Mariani. Present. Vice Chair Frazier. Present. Representative Johnson. Present. Re Representative Edelson. Present. Representative Feist. Present. Representative Grossel. Representative Grossel. Representative Grossel is having internet issues. He's working on getting that resolved. Representative Hollins. Present. Representative Hewitt. Present. Representative Cleborn. Present. Representative Long. Present. Representative Lucero. Lucero present. Representative Mueller. Mueller present. Representative Novotny. Body present. Representative O'Neill, excused. Representative Pinto. Present. Representative Poston. Present. Representative Raleigh. Raleigh present. Representative Vang. Present. Representative Shung. Present. And that concludes roll call. Very well, thank you. We do have a quorum and we'll keep an eye out uh, for Representative uh, Grassel. Uh, we'll ex be expecting him uh, uh, shortly. So we'll make sure that he gets uh, recorded in if, if, um, if he's able to, to join us. Um, members, this hearing is being conducted under the Minnesota House Rule 10.01, allowing members to debate and vote by means of distant voting remote electronic voting or other means to allow legislative operations while preserving the safety of the public, staff, and members. The hearing may be viewed via the House webcast. The link is on the committee website page. Those interested in testifying can email the committee administrator, Janelle Lundy, 24 hours before a hearing. Email uh, is also found on the committee website page. Uh, members, today is part of uh, uh, the Chair's Public Safety Innovation uh, Week. We, we uh, will continue sharing Representative Fraser's Bill, House File 2747, uh, with a look at Article 3. Um, and so the Chair will uh, move uh, off the table, uh, House File, and uh, the clerk can check me on the number. I think I'm right, House File 2747. And uh, Representative Fraser, your motion um, uh, therefore is still before us, um, which is to uh, refer to the Committee on Ways and Means. Uh, but I will be laying this bill um, uh, over for further conversation and shaping and for uh, further hearing um, and possible amendments uh, later in this session. Members, I did skip over, over an important item of business. I, I apologize to Representative Sean. Representative Sean, I believe you have a motion for us this morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to move the minutes. Very well. Representative Sean moves adoption of the minutes of February 3rd. Um, discussion? Representative Johnson, a voice vote I, I trust will suffice? That it will. Very well. All in favor of Representative Sean's motion to adopt the uh, February uh, 3rd minutes, please say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion prevails. Thank you, Representative Sean. Um, and now back to uh, House File uh, 27. Uh, I'm sorry, I did misspeak. Uh, it's House File 2724. Uh, right. I got my numbers mixed up. Uh, I'm hearing correct here. So the chair will move off the table. House file 2724 uh, and Representative Frazier, your motion to refer House file 2724 to the Committee on Ways and Means is now before us. And again, uh, we will not be uh, moving, acting on this bill uh, today. The chair will be laying it over at the conclusion of today's uh, debate. Um, and uh, that'll give us then time for you to continue to work with uh, members on this bill. Uh, we'll have uh, uh, hearings uh, uh, down the, um, the stretch here uh, to uh, possibly amend, debate, and then act uh, on the bill. 
Uh, so, uh, Representative uh, Frazier, um, today's review um, is really the third leg, the third leg of your um, uh, bill's approach to data-driven best practices for advancing public safety in 2022 and beyond. Um, and your bill, uh, this is the third part. Uh, the first part uh, had to do with uh, investing in effective law enforcement, particularly helping with capacity uh, needs. The second part was yesterday's conversation and in investing community in community intervention and prevention. Uh, and then today's part is about building trust needed for public safety with clear, fair accountability and citizen involvement. Um, members, I would be remiss if I didn't refer to uh, the events this week, given uh, this committee, and we've already spoken a little bit about this. Uh, it's been a tough week for Minnesotans and um, for uh, many of us who uh, have been impacted pretty closely by some of the events um, uh, here in the Twin Cities. Um, uh, we had the shooting committed by, uh, allegedly by youth uh, with no criminal records um, that produced a huge uh, professional effort on law, local law enforcement to identify, quickly identify and detain the alleged uh, offenders uh, I would submit that that helped with uh, community trust. Um, and um, we also had the confusion and tragic police killing of a young black man in the midst of an apparent no-knock warrant when he was not the subject of the warrant and the immediate disintegration of community citizen trust in that local law enforcement action uh, and um, individuals. And so in many ways, uh, this sets the stage for today's conversation. Um, today's conversation, I would encourage us not to think of as a standalone proposal. It is uh, that third leg, if you will, of the proverbial uh, three-legged stool approach for the state's role in working and resourcing locals for innovation in public safety. I look forward to our conversation today. Representative Frazier, I'll begin with you, and then we'll move quickly to House Research to do a summary walkthrough of Article 3. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Lee Johnson, committee members. And Chair, thank you for laying out that context and for providing that frame. And I, I myself, I just want to say my thoughts, my condolences out to the family and friends and the loved ones of Amir Locke. Um, Amir should still be with us. She'll be here with us today. So my thoughts are with them this morning. And you know, today we're going to be discussing Article 3, and that's the law enforcement policy section. Um, this section speaks to a reality that I don't believe we have truly leaned into, that we need to start treating community confidence as the law enforcement intelligence resource that it is. As the chair said, this is not a standalone piece. This article is an essential piece of this bill because we can't implement innovative strategies without the confidence and trust of the community. That confidence and trust from community will make the jobs of our officers easier and in turn make our communities safer. So I'm looking forward to this conversation today to discuss the items in the bill, looking forward to the feedback. Uh, we have already received some feedback on some of these items, and we do have language that we'll be adjusting based on that feedback. As I said before, these conversations will continue over the next several weeks, and we plan to have a bill that uh, crafted with the input and consideration and thoughtfulness that all Minnesotans deserve to create a public safety framework that keeps everyone safe. With that, Chair, I will turn it over to staff. Very well. Thank you, Representative Fraser. Uh, and I believe this again is uh, Mr. Ben Johnson from our House uh, Research staff. And uh, Mr. Johnson, if you can come forward and um, take us through uh, a summary of Article 3, uh, we would greatly appreciate it. Good morning, Mr. Chair. This is Jeff Diebel. Oh, it's Jeff Diebel. All yes. right. Well, welcome, uh, Mr. Diebel. I haven't had a chance to call on you yet this uh, session. so. Um, always good to see you. Thank you, sir, for being with us uh, today. Th the same for you, sir. Thank you. Uh, I begin with uh, Section 1 of Article 3. This provides the post boards with the authority to take action on a peace officer's license for criminal conduct that does not result in a conviction. Section 2 of the bill adds additional requirements that must be included in body camera policies adopted by agencies that have uh, implement the use of body cameras, including timelines for disclosure of use of force incident video. 
This language is similar to what was passed in the House Public Safety Omnibus Bill in 2021. Section three is also similar to language that was passed in the omnibus bill from last session. This relates to civilian review of law enforcement officers and agencies. This uh, language would authorize local units of government to establish civilian oversight councils and grant those oversight councils the authority to make findings of fact and impose discipline on officers. Section four is a, a new section and this creates a task force on alternative courses to peace officer licensure. The purposes of the task force are to one, increase recruitment of new peace officers, two, to increase the diversity of racial and racial makeup and professional background of licensed peace officers, and three, to promote education and training in community policing models. Section five of the article three appropriates $450,000 to the post board, to hire four investigators to perform compliance reviews and investigate alleged conduct, code of conduct violations by peace officers. Section six is another appropriation which provides $50,000 to post board to support the task force created under section four. Section seven is a repealer and this repeals the special procedures established in statute for the post board to handle investigations of peace officers accused of misconduct. By re repealing these provisions, the post board would be required to comply with the standard investigatory procedures established for other professional licensed regulatory agencies. And Mr. Chair, that concludes my overview of Article 3. Very well, thank you, uh, Mr. Devo. And uh, uh, obviously, we'll, there'll be a discussion and questions, uh, so we may call on you again uh, today at some point, but thank you. Uh, again for that. Uh, Representative Frazier, uh, we're going to then uh, begin if, um, uh, if it's okay with you, I can just go ahead with the uh, uh, calling up the testifiers that uh, have uh, signed up. Is that? I, that is so, that is right, Chair. Very well. Uh, we're going to begin with um, uh, Michelle Gross of Communities United Against uh, Police Brutality. Uh, I believe she may be joined by um, the mother of Kobe uh, Dimmock, Dimmock uh, Heisler. Some of you will recall we had, um, you know, uh, hearing a discussion uh, relative to uh, young Kobe uh, last year and the year before, um, and his mother is here uh, to also offer uh, testimony. Uh, I have Amity, but I apologize, Amity, I don't have your last name, but we'll get that once we get to it. Uh, but why don't we begin with uh, Ms. Gross. Uh, please come forward, state your name for the record, and give us your testimony. Good morning. Um, my name is Michelle Gross, and I'm the president of Communities United Against Police Brutality. Chair Mariani, Vice Chair uh, Frazier, and uh, members, um, I'm pleased to testify this morning on this bill. Um, when I first saw the bill, I have to say that I liked it very much. Um, I appreciate the efforts to put this bill together, and I think that there are many, many good parts of it. Um, that said, though, I do want to address. Oh, hold on, Miss Gross. Uh, someone's got their. Uh... I think there might be you, uh, Representative Edelson. Make sure you're you're muted there. Thank you, Ms. Gross. I apologize. Please proceed. No problem. Thank you. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, some of the sections of um, Article Three related specifically to the body worn camera footage um, release, and um, the bill is written now calls for the release within seven days. And while that's certainly a, gr a vast improvement over what we have right now, um, it isn't enough, frankly. We need it, uh, the release to happen much sooner. And I think that that's evidenced by what has happened in the case of Amir Locke. Um, you know, it's important that the community get to know, but even more importantly, it's important that the family get to know what happened to their loved one. People should not agonize for days on days and, and, and as it exists now, uh, it, sometimes even months before they get to see any type of um, information about what happened to their loved one. And so it's important that this bill pass, but it's important that that timeline be moved up. We had proposed 48 hours you know, because we recognize that there is some time that's needed to prepare the fo footage and so forth. But at the same time, we think that um, 48 hours is quite adequate in the days of modern technology to make this information available, at least to the family. 
Um, so I did want to uh, raise that issue. Um, and the second thing I do want to talk about related to Article 3 is in Section 1, which is the section on um, the post board. Um, I'm really happy to see the post board get more power to take action on police officer licenses or peace officer licenses. Um, in particular, the post board, for example, after the incident with um, Mr. Floyd, the post board had no power to take the license or do anything on the a actionable on the license of Derek, um, Derek Chauvin. And to this day, this three officers are, are, who are currently in trial at federal court still have their licenses because the post board hasn't had that power. But for the last over a year now, I've been sitting on the post board rules advisory committee. We have done a great deal of work on professional standards, codes of conduct, and so forth. And the only issue that I have with Section 3, um, Article 3, rather, Section 1, is that it's a little bit too specific in terms of what the post board can address. We have more broadly defined what the post board can address through that work in the um, the Post Board Rules Advisory Committee, and I would like to see this bill cleave more closely to the work that we've spent a year, over a year doing now. And I should tell you that that work group consists of oh, over 20 people, uh, at least um, two thirds of which are law enforcement and PPOE. Um, and so it's not a group of regular ordinary folks like me, um, you know, saying you should do this, you should do this. These are law enforcement professionals who feel the need to call on law enforcement to maintain high standards. And I want to support that work by saying that we need to make sure that um, that this bill, again, you know, is a little bit closer to what we've actually hammered out in that work in the last year. Um, and finally, I want to say that I'm very pleased about the extra funding for the post board. The post board wants to do a good job, but needs the resources to do it. And so to the degree that we um, get the post board more in compliance with the way that other professional licensing agencies operate and to the degree that we give them the funds to um, be able to realize the, those um, ambitious goals, this would be a very, very good thing. And so, um, you know, I like seeing that money in there. I want to make sure it stays in there. So um, thank you for hearing from me this morning. And I turn it now over to um, Amity Dimick, if that's if that's OK with you, Chair Mariani. Absolutely, Ms. Gross, thank you for your uh, testimony. Hopefully you can stick around for any questions uh, that might arise. Uh, as I well. certainly thank will. You. All right, and so now we have um, Ms. Amity um, Dimmock. Um, uh, if you can come forward, give us your name uh, for the record and please provide us with our testimony. Thank you for joining us this morning. Hello, everybody. Uh, Chair, Vice Chair, and distinguished uh, other people on this call. My name is Amity Dimmick. Some of you might know me already. I am the mother of Kobe Dimmick Heisler. He was the young 21 year old boy who was on the autism spectrum, who was murdered in his home on a uh, call that started out as domestic, but was quite clear was a mental health um, situation when they showed up. Um, I was called to testify on behalf of this bill, but I've really been conflicted because I don't really agree with it. So I agree something needs to be done. Um, but when I look at the view only in seven days, I agree with Michelle Gross, that is, that's unacceptable. Um, two days, the Kobe bill is where it should be. Um, one of the things that really comes to light when I think about this is that in the George Floyd case, in the Dante Wright case, and now in the Amir Locke case, um, officials were able to present the body worn cameras within 24 to 48 hours due to public pressure. I don't think that any individual family should have to rely on public pressure to get videos early. The only reason we were finally able to view the videos in my son's case was because George Floyd got murdered in Minneapolis was in riot situation and uh, Mayor Mike Elliott and Chief Gannon were concerned that that would be brought to Brooklyn Center. So four days after um, George Floyd was murdered, we got invited to view the body cam videos. The second thing I will say about the view only is that's not fair to a family. Um, when they ask you in to view the videos, they essentially give you X amount of time. You get to view them maybe once, maybe twice. 
Um, since we have gotten the videos for my son in order to really understand what is going on in those videos, I have watched, and keep in mind, I'm watching my son get murdered 30 to 40 to 50 times each video. And it's not just the four videos they show when they call us in. There are 44 videos in my son's case. So when they also talk about viewing videos, what do you really mean? Do you mean just the main ones involved? Do you mean all 44? Because we certainly didn't have access to the 44 videos and there is information on those other videos also. Um, so I do have a, and I feel really bad because I feel like I'm supposed to be um, supporting this bill and I do, I support the money going for body worn cameras, but the uh, logistics of the, um, what we're going to do with the body worn cameras is what I disagree with. So I disagree with the seven days. I disagree with it being view only for the families. I disagree with the fact that the request can be denied by a chief law enforcement officer. We know how that goes. And I also disagree with the fact that it takes 90 days for the family to actually receive them. So I really um, almost considered pulling out of this testimony because besides giving funding, and I agree with the seven days, but the seven days would have to be view and give to the family. So um, I've never come to testify where I essentially don't agree with everything that I'm testifying on behalf, but just in my heart of hearts, I could not come and um, say anything other than what I'm saying right now. It's just, it's not fair. And you also have to keep in mind that when you are a family in a fight against the police, that battle is already so Un, unbalanced and unfair um and to not give the families the videos is 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 an insult uh, but i just really want to point out the fact that in the last few murders in minneapolis they have been able to produce the videos instantly and all pardon my french all hell has not broken loose so i i fully disagree with one family not being able to get public out outcry enough for elected officials to produce those videos while other people, like in my son's case, we just had to sit and wait and wait and wait and wait and wait until another black man got murdered. That's not acceptable. So I apologize for coming and kind of supporting the bill. I do support the funding, but I fully support a, a much, much uh, stronger, much stronger language in the uh, body language in, in the uh, body worn camera language. And I also don't see anything about the fact that they mute body worn cameras. So all I got to say is expect to see me again, fighting for uh, way more increased um, policies on body worn camera usage and what's going on with that. Because I really do think that people in general think that when we talk about body worn cameras, what I'm starting to realize, people actually think that officers turn their body worn cameras on when they go to work and don't turn it off until they get done with work. And quite honestly, I think that's what should happen. And uh, KSTP just did a, uh, an investigative report and one of the officers, the, the chief of the Minnesota Police Board saying, oh, they're not trying to hide anything. The reason for body worn cameras is to show the engagement with the community. Once that tragic situation has happened, what happens afterwards is not the engagement with the community. That's not the only reason we have officers wear body worn cameras. If there's a cover up, it's gonna happen exactly after the situation happens and those body worn cameras need to remain on. Thank you for listening to my testimony and sorry I could not. Um, um, not at all, uh, not at all. Us any further. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Timmick. I really appreciate um, um, well, first of all, let me just see, uh, continue to express my, um, as a parent myself, you know, uh, my uh, deep uh, sympathy and solidarity with your loss. Um, I saw you on that interview, too. I appreciate you. Oh, uh, appreciate you right back. Thank you. Um, and I do hope that your voice continues to be part of our uh, many voices here. Um, you know, it, it, no bill, quite frankly, ever gets passed if it gets passed the way it was introduced. Uh, uh, bills do get shaped, influenced, and changed um, based on a number of factors, including the participation of people most impacted uh, by, by the bills, uh, as you and your family uh, have been. So uh, as long as you're willing to keep uh, interacting with us, even uh, when we may not uh, rise to your expectations, uh, 
uh, kind of might uh, continue um, uh, working I, with you. So. I really appreciate that because I did have a concern. I did call Michelle last night and say, what if I, what if they don't like me and just don't want me to come back again? Because I'm kind of like, yeah. so, good. But, you know, this stuff is very, very, very important to me clearly. Absolutely. So I, Absolutely. I appreciate it. If you can stick around for any possible questions, yep. uh, that would be wonderful. Next, we're going to hear from uh, Mr. Eric Rice, who, who is an attorney um and handled the uh case on regards to mr jaleel uh stallings a pretty uh high visible case um uh, just within the last year mr rice uh, welcome to the committee please state your name for the record and give us your testimony uh, my name is eric rice and thank you for your time today and i do want to note that i'm appearing in my personal capacity even though i do represent mr stallings and I want to speak to the provision in the bill which uh, would eliminate the conviction requirement for disciplining officers. And as part of that, I want to provide a brief recap of what happened in Mr. Stallings' matter. In that case, Mr. Stallings was out trying to protest uh, during an evening and officers came by in an unmarked van and shot at him without warning or announcement with uh, less lethal rounds. He fired back in self-defense and got into cover, learned they were officers and surrendered. Uh, then officers beat and struck him. And then after the fact, officers provided misleading and false statements about the matter to implicate Mr. Stallings and try to justify their use of force. And over the last year and a half, Mr. Stallings was charged with uh, criminal offenses. We successfully obtained an acquittal after trial. But I want to talk less about what did happen, and I want to emphasize what didn't happen. And in that case, there appeared to be obvious and substantial misconduct captured on the body camera and throughout the investigation. And despite this case closing in now on two years, I'm not aware of any actions that have been taken against the officers involved. It appears that no investigation was pending during the year and a half that the criminal matter was pending. And to my knowledge, those sorts of disciplinary actions only occurred once this case received substantial public attention uh, in September of last year. And it's particularly concerning because uh, as part of my work on the Stallings case, I've reached out to law enforcement pro pro uh, professionals to find out you know, what their thoughts are, what would be helpful to them. And overwhelmingly, I've heard that it is hard for good officers to do their job when the public doesn't trust them, when the public won't assist them, when the public sees things like the Stallings case and you see these officers commit misconduct and then nothing happens and they're frustrated. And a lot of these officers are at other agencies and they can't control what happens to these officers, and they just need to deal with it. They need to convince the public that they are different, that they should be trusted, that they can do their job effectively. And I'm in favor of removing the conviction requirement here because the post board is in a perfect position to provide that level of integrity for the profession. It is a statewide board that is focused on professional licensure. So I'm a criminal defense attorney. I know the criminal justice system well, and it's good at handling matters of depriving people of liberty, right? So should a person go to prison? And for that question, it's important to have a very rigorous process to make sure you are right. It's not enough that the person's probably guilty. It's not enough that there's no evidence that they're innocent. You have to be extremely sure before you deprive a person of their basic liberty. Licensing is a different question. There are many professional licensures that don't require a criminal conviction in order to take disciplinary action. There the concerns are, is this person fit to continue operating as an officer? Do they need some sort of corrective action? Do they need some sort of disciplinary action? And it's important that that happen effectively because otherwise the public sees these videos released and they don't trust officers and it makes all the good officers jobs harder. And one frustrating portion is that with the Amir Locke case, it appears that some of the officers involved in the Stallings incident were involved in operations in that case. And so not only have no actions occurred to my knowledge to the officers involved, but they're still operating uh, business as usual. And here we have another incident that further erodes public trust. I read the, the responses to the conviction requirement and a number of parties claim that um, the current system is sufficient, that we don't need changes because local municipalities can enforce their own, that they already have the tools to maintain the integrity of the profession. And I can say I have used all my resources and know-how and efforts to try to get accountability, discipline, engagement with the Stallings matter. And here we are coming up on two years, and to my knowledge, nothing has happened to date. And so I would submit that the current system is not effective, and I would support removing the conviction requirement to empower the post board to step in and maintain the integrity of the profession when it needs to happen. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Rice, and I hope that you're able to uh, also uh, stay with us for uh, a bit in case there might be some questions and um, ability for you to com further comment. All right, very well. Uh, we uh, then the final um, uh, testifier um, for this uh, first section, and then uh, we will go into a discussion. And by the way, Representative Grass, I still have you on the top of that list um, as promised from uh, yesterday. Um, but our next uh, testifier then is, um, oh, uh, police, uh, uh, Minneapolis Police Department Chief Amelia uh, Huffman and Andrew Hawkins uh, of the Minneapolis Office of Police Conduct uh, Review. Uh, please come forward, uh, give us uh, your name for the record, and please give us your testimony. Uh, good morning. Thank good you morning. for the opportunity to testify on the post board provision in House File 2724. For the record, my name is Amelia Huffman, and I have the honor of serving currently as the interim chief for the Minneapolis Police Department. I'm happy to be here with you today in this capacity after the retirement of our former chief, Daria Arredondo. We are very thankful for his 32 years of dedicated service and his commitment to the profession to the Minneapolis community and to our department. It is now our duty, my duty, to continue the work begun by Chief Arredondo and carried into the next chapter. This work is an opportunity to continue investing in transformative growth for the MPD, to capitalize on the strengths and commitment of our officers, our professional staff, to rebuild relationships and look for opportunities to partner with community and government. Policing is about community caretaking, and I believe that my officers must come to work every day and every shift to safeguard and care for our community members. This is a sacred trust placed in every officer in the Minneapolis Police Department and indeed in every officer in our profession. The Minneapolis Police Department supports efforts in HF 2724 that would move the post board toward functioning like other licensure boards in the state. I support the efforts to strengthen the standards of conduct and the role of the board in sanctioning licenses for misconduct, including the removal of a requirement for a criminal conviction prior to post board action. Both communities and our profession rely on the post board to set and enforce standards that reflect the authority and responsibility entrusted in the police. Choosing to hold a post license entails the obligation to faithfully protect and safeguard the communities that we serve. Community trust and accountability are at the core of what all groups are calling for. And a more unified and set standard at the post board will help us move toward those goals. I'm supportive of giving the post board the authority and resources to investigate and reach a decision on the licensure of peace officers. This will create more consistent and elevated standards of conduct for peace officers across the state and ensure that egregious acts are looked at consistently. Articulating high standards of conduct for police officers and taking fair, consistent action to uphold those standards supports the work of every officer and every agency dedicated to increasing peace and safety across our state. It builds trust and bolsters respect for our profession. And trust and professionalism are critically critical, not only for working with community members to address crime and safety, but to support recruiting and retention at a time when many agencies like mine need to recruit and hire people of strong character and commitment to public service. In addition, I support expanding the circumstances under which the post board can review, suspend, or revoke licenses. This supports the work of local law enforcement agencies in holding officers accountable for misconduct. While chief law enforcement officers understand that much of the discipline that we impose is meant to change behavior ensure good public service and demonstrate public trust. We also understand that some egregious conduct breaks the public trust and demonstrates that our employee is not fit to wear our badge. A strong post board with the power to review, suspend or revoke a license supports the work being done by chiefs to take clear action against misconduct, rebuild relationships and support police community partnerships. I also support resourcing and coordination efforts at the post board and elsewhere to expand recruitment pathways for future peace officers. We need to be actively pursuing candidates who might be interested in law enforcement as a profession 
as we continue to evolve and grow to meet the needs of the future. As departments across the country have experienced significant attrition and officer shortages, it's clear that we must be creative in adapting to the changing landscape and find new ways to attract the kind of people that we want to be the police officers for today and tomorrow. And this will require concerted efforts across state and local levels. And I fully support all the funding and structural efforts with that aim. Minneapolis Police Department looks forward to our continued partnership in building more community trust, accountability, and collaboration with the communities that we serve. And I thank you very much for the opportunity to share my perspective today. Thank you, Chief. Uh, thank you for being with us here uh, today. Um, you're, uh, this has been a tough week uh, for Minneapolis and uh, for um, the family of the uh, young man uh, that we mentioned earlier, um, uh, Amir, uh, and also a tough time for your uh, uh, professionals uh, that, that uh, you guide in, in your city. And so I really appreciate you uh, taking the time to be with us um, uh, here today. Um, I, I do think it's important for the Pulse to uh, be working. Um, the Pulse is really the state, um, for the state to be working with our locals, uh, working with our chiefs, working with our rank and file, uh, working with our local elected officials for all the uh, goals that you uh, stated. And I'm sure Representative Fraser's uh, posture um, is one of that type of heightened collaboration. Um, I also uh, do think uh, we've heard a lot about the need for create creative approaches to the uh, pathways issue, uh, which is challenging um, all uh, of our local um, law enforcement agencies at, at, at the at the uh, at the present moment. Um, would love for you to uh, uh, stick around in case there might be questions, but certainly understand if you need to uh, run. Uh, you've got uh, quite a quite a. Uh, and a few big things on your hands right now. And so again, I appreciate your time uh, with us here today, Chief. All right. Um, and I did mention that, um, oh, never mind. Um, all right, why don't we go to questions then? Um, uh, we're doing fairly good on time members. Um, so we do have another round of uh, testifiers, uh, including the post itself. Um, uh, to finish us off, uh, but we have, uh, we've got uh, some fairly decent time here. Um, so um, we'll go into the discussion uh, uh, part. Um, and if, again, if I can't get to everyone, I'll make sure that whoever I didn't get to, I'll put them on the top of the list for the next round. Um, and so why don't we begin and represent Grasso. Uh, I did promise you um, that you'd be first uh, in today. So please, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, if you wouldn't mind, uh, could you bump me down the list a couple and let uh, and let a couple ask their questions first? Sure, be glad to. Thank you, sir. Very well. Uh, I have Representative Cleveland. You might be muted, Representative Cleveland. All right, and they need to come back there as well. Sorry, oh, right I apologize. On. I couldn't yeah. get my, um, you know, I'm using four screens and sometimes you forget which mouse goes to which computer, that, right? So that, That's never happened to me. <laughs> <laughs> Forgive me. Um, I just wanted to ask a couple of questions regarding um, Ms. Demock's uh, um, testimony. And um, Firstly, I'd like to begin by thanking her for coming in today. I realize that, you know, this is re-traumatization over and over and over, and I certainly don't want to add to her grief and trauma, but it seems to me as though she's in a unique position to help us in the formulation of this type of legislation uh, to understand what it means to view 44 videos uh, is just incredible. So I would ask, and it's not a question you have to answer today. I want you to uh, take time to think about this, but I would really appreciate hearing from you um, what you thought uh, would be appropriate standards for either permissive language to see the video or denial criteria of allowing video to be seen. You know, we want to always be fair, uh, both to the accused and to the victim when we talk about public safety policy, right? 
So um, what would be legitimate grounds for letting uh, videos be released in this quick time frame, And what would be reasons for denying? Right, because again, I think you're in a unique position. And then um, in the defining uh, the clarity around which videos the families really need to be able to see immediately, right? If you're asking, um, and I don't, I'm not saying it's inappropriate, right? But when you're talking about the potential of 44, 50, 100 potential videos out there, um, we want to make sure that uh, accurate information is given while also dealing with the trauma that the family is going through at the same time. And that's why I say, I don't, please don't, I don't expect an answer today. But if you could work with us going forward, I would greatly appreciate that. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Sounds like a wonderful invitation to um, uh, continue to have this uh, Dimmick continue to work with us um, as well. I'm sorry, Emily. I'm sorry, Ms. Dimmick, would you care to quickly uh, respond? Well, I just, you know, I, I'm, I'm always happy to um, work with folks going forward because um, I like to think I'm intelligent enough to realize that just what I want isn't going to work isn't going to just happen and that um, there's many people with differing views. And so I do understand in this world of politics that it is um, some give and take. Um, I just feel like it's my job to continue to push for what I think is right. And, um, and, uh, and, and, and I try to do it as respectfully as possible so that I continue to be asked back to the table. But don't get me wrong. Sometimes I have different conversations going on in my head. And, and I just got to say, and I just, I, I, and, and I would, it, and I would be remiss if I didn't bring this up right now to um, Miss Amelia Huffman talking about transparency. And I don't consider that being transparent is having herself and um, Mayor Fry run out of a press conference and stop answering questions, especially when the questions are, hey, okay, so you said one thing, then you produce a video, but then the video doesn't match what you just said. Yeah. And um, so I, as long I, as we're I, talking about transparency, I just don't see how that's going to happen when that's the sort of response that the community gets from our, our uh, leaders in, in these positions. Yeah, thank you. I think transparency and public trust it absolutely goes to the core uh, of, of all, all of this. Um, so uh, to be continued, look forward to uh, uh, getting your advice and shaping, I'm sure, Representative Frazier's door is open uh, to that as well. Uh, Representative Long, I've got you next on the list. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, appreciate it. And uh, my my question is for uh, Interim Chief Huffman. Um, uh, chief Huffman, when you were the Chief Inspector of my home precinct, the fifth precinct, we went to some community meetings together, and um, I know how important uh, working with community and building community uh, trust is uh, to you and, and to the department. Um, Certainly incidents like, like the shooting of Amir Locke make rebuilding trust much harder, as you know. Uh, I wanna thank you today for your support of giving the post board expanded authority over, over licenses. I think that would be a really important step. And I think as we are putting this bill together and, and uh, going forward in the process, we're likely to hear some comments that all we really need in public safety is more resources. So I was hoping you could expand on what trust means for your department to be effective and how uh, trust helps build public safety for the city of Minneapolis. Chief Hoffman. Thank you very much and thank you for the question. Uh, absolutely, um, you know, it really fundamentally is impossible for uh, police to be able to do the work that they want to do, that we want to do um, in the way that's most effective without building relationships and trust with the community. Um, you know, most of the information about what's happening and where it's happening um, and what's most problematic in community is in community. Uh, and so those relationships and the ability to have open channels of communication um, is the way that we get out ahead of things that uh, are brewing, trouble that's brewing, um, put a stop to things that uh, may happen before they happen, um, and the way that we really can uh, collect evidence and solve crimes uh, in many cases when uh, terrible things have already happened. Uh, it's also incredibly important for our uh, recruiting relationships, of course, 
Um, it's very important for us in Minneapolis to be able to identify candidates who have deep relationships with the city, who have relationships in the community, um, who love the community and want to come to Minneapolis to work to serve community. Uh, whether that's growing up in the city, going to school in the city, belonging to a house of worship in the city. Um, there are a lot of ways to have deep relationships in the community here in Minneapolis. Uh, and without having uh, trust and respect and understanding and that kind of communication that only comes when we are known and know folks in our community, um, it's very difficult uh, to be as effective in recruiting those folks as we would like. So both for our crime prevention um, our ability to solve crimes and our ability to bring in the next generation of law enforcement and law enforcement leaders, um, that community trust is incredibly important. Representative Lyon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you uh, for that, Chief Huffman. Um, I've, I've heard that from other Minneapolis police officers I've interacted with that you really can't solve crimes, do your job effectively without trust. And I appreciate you, you sharing that with us today as well. Um, I'm curious, if you could comment further on, on what the role of uh, accountability plays in community trust and um, how important that is, uh, particularly with the, the post board reforms that you've mentioned um, for community to, to be able to respond and uh, what role you see as, as that accountability mechanism for uh, those officers for whom uh, post board might, um, might make a, a determination as serious as to remove a license, that, how that could help with creating public safety. Chief Hoffman. Thank you. Um, absolutely. Um, you know, in addition to, um, you know, our strong efforts um, in collaboration with Post Board um, to have uh, really powerful standards for folks coming into the profession in terms of background investigations and standards, uh, standards for education, um, the next real piece of it is having uh, vigorous accountability mechanisms to support uh, professionalism, to support the faith in the community um, that when there is uh, a mistake uh, or when there is misconduct, appropriate action will be taken, um, not only uh, by local agencies and the discipline that we impose, um, but again, statewide for the entire profession. Um, so having those really high standards of conduct set by post and post having the ability to take action as the agency that issues a license to then sanction that license for the conduct of a peace officer, I think bolsters the professionalism of every officer around the state of Minnesota um, and gives communities and individual community members and those of us in the profession um, the comfort of knowing that these standards are being maintained across the board for every officer in the state of Minnesota. Uh, it also, I think, is really tangibly important for us um, at this point, as we look at uh, recruiting, and like many agencies in the state of Minnesota, uh, some of the folks we're recruiting are officers who are already licensed um, in other agencies around the state. Um, and so uh, knowing going forward that POST would be maintaining uh, standards of conduct for uh, every officer who holds a license, uh, then also adds to that level of comfort as you're reviewing someone's background to potentially hire them for your agency, um, that the conduct uh, that they're being held to is, uh, is set statewide by the post board. So I think it's really reflective of our need as a profession um, to invest in strong standards of accountability um, that are held across the board for the state to bolster that uh, public trust and, and also to just bolster our own sense internally um, that as a profession, we're stepping up to this moment um, and really holding ourselves accountable. Very well. Representative Long, I'm going to push on with Representative Devotny. I'll make sure we get as many voices here as possible. Thank you uh, for your uh, inquiries. Representative Devotny. Thank you, Chair Mariani. For uh, Representative Frazier, uh, on the alternative task force for alternative peace officer licensure, you've got a provision to have the attorney general or a designee on that board. What's the thought behind that? Representative Frazier. Uh, thank you, Representative Vodney. I appreciate the question. Uh, that brought the, the board, I believe we've got about 15 members on there. We're trying to make sure we include all stakeholders that are involved in our public safety framework uh, for their communities and for the state. That's the reason. And, and also the, the Attorney General's office, uh, they are the attorney that represents the post. So I think they should probably have some input. Representative Vodney. Thank you, Chair Mariana.
All right, very well. Um, Representative Grossel. Only trying, to get you, trying to get these old fat fingers to work right. <laughs> Only if you have a question, Representative Grossel. I just. Uh, you know, yes, sir, I do. I all do. right, very well. Um, Mr. Chair, and I, and I guess I just, uh, I'm going to ask you first. Do you recall? Do you recall our conversation when uh, you first took over as a chair in the committee? That you know, you you said that you welcome my views as a former law enforcement officer on this committee. Of course. Okay. All right. And in these past years, sir, um, and and this I'll I'll jump over to uh, Representative Frazier as well. In these past years. Uh, I have gotten the distinct feeling and impression that, in fact, my input and others' input from, from our side of the aisle has not been welcomed or received. I have tried for years, I have tried for years to help address the violent crime, the violent crime. And, and this, this is not, an, uh, uh, as has been described, an uptick in violent crime. This is a massive increase in violent crime in two of our major cities and it's spreading across the state. It's spreading. Um, you recall the demographics that I shared last session of those who have been most affected by this massive increase in violent crime. Representative Ross, are you directing that to the chair? I take it. Those, those, it's, it's two, I guess, to, to both, yes, sir. And uh, in those two, uh, the demographics that I, that I received from the boots on the ground said that the majority of the people who were being affected by this violent crime increase were from the black community. And that the majority of their perpetrators were also from the black community. Now, Minneapolis has sent, had since taken the demographics off of their site, which they shouldn't. People need to know. I mean, if you want, if you want transparency, people need to know what's going on and who's being harmed. This has been going on. There's this, this massive increase. We've hit record, we've hit record statistics as far as the increase in homicides, rapes physical assaults of all levels, domestics, carjackings, you name it, you name it. This has gone, this has gone completely off of the rails in this state. And we have offered time and again to help to try to bring this under control. I offered it to the mayor. I, I, I suggested these are things that you need to do but no one has wanted to listen. Representative Grasso, I, I, uh, you and I have known each other for several years and I have a deep appreciation for your passion and, and we've also um, have uh, striven to work together. I like to think we've been able to accomplish some things together. Um, I would say that uh, the purpose of this uh, entire week and this hearing is precisely to engage with one another um, and not to move this bill uh, this week, but to really be informed in a very public way. Um, I certainly look forward to anyone. Um, um, and I think, you know, Representative Fraser, you're, you're, you're getting uh, all sorts of uh, both angst, but also uh, heartfelt um, opinions from all sides um, on, on, on your bill. Um, and so it is the intention of this chair, uh, Representative Grasso, and you, you and I have served together, so I think you know I, I mean this, you know, to uh, spend the time that we need to spend over the course of the next several weeks to uh, shape this bill and then bring it back for uh, amendments from you and others to debate those and uh, take those votes and then move forward. Um, I think Representative Fraser has um, a response, um, and, and it's a response, but a response to the issues that you're concerned about uh, very much so. Um, I, I do want to make sure we get these other testifiers in, so I'll, I'll you know, if you have a question have or any final comments, uh, please, sir, uh, go ahead. Thank you. 
the uh, Representative Frazier, this would be for you. Have you done any ride-alongs with either your local police departments? Have you done any ride-alongs with the Minneapolis Police Department? Representative Frazier. Yes, I have with my local police departments. Absolutely. I keep in constant communication with my local law enforcement agencies here in my cities. Okay. Now, have you done any ride-alongs in Minneapolis? Have you talked to the officers there and and, and seen their state, right? The, the state of being right, right now with them, the demoralized and the, um, just the, just the strain that they have been under since they have been understaffed, under-equipped, and under-supported. I have talked to officers in Minneapolis, yes. Sorry, Mr. Sorry, Chair. Uh, Representative Grosso, thank you for the question. Yes, I have had conversations with officers from Minneapolis. Okay. Uh, Representative Grosso, so, so we'll, you understand. We'll you understand. Uh, I, I, I apologize. Uh, well, I don't apologize. Mr. Chair, because I have been watching this, I have been watching uh, this massive increase in violence crime spiral upwards. And I guess I have one last question, and I, I hope uh, either Representative Frazier or yourself could answer this, or whoever may want to answer this. Why has it taken this long to step up? And I'll have. Um, has it has it reached the suburbs? So now we want to pay attention. Why has it taken this long to step forward to want to support your law enforcement, to want to help back them, and to want to stop this increase in violent crime? Why has it taken this long? Representative Grasso, I'll, I'll handle that. Then we're going to move forward, and I'll handle it by actually. Um, calling into question your question, um, you know, any review of our work over the last three years uh, runs contrary to that belief. Um, in fact, um, for three years in a row, the House has persistently come forward with an omnibus bill that far outspends and proposes to invest in the entire array of public safety than the Senate does, has. In fact, uh, two, two, three years ago, I was stunned that the Senate actually went backwards. They wouldn't even fund the police training fund, um, zero, uh, that uh, our chiefs and our sheriffs told us was a top priority for them. I listened. Uh, we proposed funding it. Um, and it was only for, you know, as a virtue of us per insisting and persisting that we were able to, to do that. Uh, last year, I carried the bill, two bills, um, you know, for the governor's uh, proposal for collaborative uh, work across jurisdictions, uh, gearing up for potential uh, major uh, social uh, upheavals and, and uh, discontent. Uh, I carried the, uh, the supplementary bill for our state patrol uh, as they wound up having to eat their seed corn in order to help all various communities uh, be safe. So, you know, I, I think the real issue here before us is um, does Representative Fraser's bill reflect a good response uh, to uh, the issues that concern all of us because those are very real issues and how do we make that better? But to question, I, you know, quite frankly, you know, Representative Fraser or this chair's commitment to uh, both law enforcement in a conventional way and public safety in general, you know, the evidence just, you know, it just doesn't support that, you know, that perspective. I certainly understand your feelings as a former uh, law enforcement officer. Uh, I want to honor that and honor your work uh, in that. Uh, but quite frankly, I, I won't stand publicly for being accused of not supporting uh, all the aspects of public safety that, that we need to. But this conversation will continue. We do have several members still uh, in the queue. However, I'm going to keep you on the queue. I'm going to move forward at this point uh, with the next part of our uh, discussion. Uh, Representative Fraser, we have uh, three testifiers, I believe. We're going to begin with uh, Andrew Hawkins, Minneapolis Office of Police Conduct Review. Mr. Uh, Hawkins, please come forward. 
Good morning, Chair Mariani, uh, Vice Chair Frazier, and members of the committee. Um, my name is Andrew Hawkins. I'm the Chief of Staff for the Minneapolis Department of Civil Rights. Um, the Office of Police Conduct Review is a civilian division uh, within our department, and I'm joining you today just to kind of uh, provide an overview and some additional information about you know, the oversight structure that we're currently um, utilizing in the city of Minneapolis. Um, oversight in the city of Minneapolis actually goes back to the early 90s. The Office of Police Conduct Review was stood up in 2012. Um, and uh, the Office of Police Conduct Review specifically, as a division of the Civil Rights Department, is responsible for investigations of police misconduct in the city. Uh, it also has the authority to carry out research and studies. Um, and one of the unique uh, things I think about the Office of Police Conduct Review is that it, en it enjoys direct data access uh, to systems of record, which is intended to provide expedited you know expedited uh, access to data and resources that are needed to do uh, research and study projects um, you know special projects uh, and you know the, any type of review that's essentially the closest that we get to you know preventative um, oversight um, 100 percent of the complaints filed in the city of Minneapolis and well with regard to police conduct review are reviewed by civilian staff in the office of police conduct review um, they, they perform an intake investigation. At that point, we actually have a partnership with Minneapolis Internal Affairs, where um, the director of the Office of Police Conduct Review will sit down with the commander from Internal Affairs to do an intake review and assign cases to investigators uh, in the city. Um, if you, when you file, you do have the um, ability to identify whether you'd like a sworn investigator or a civilian investigator, and we do our best to make sure that, kind of based on resource allocation, that we're getting people you know assigned to the investigators they'd like to see. Um, once a case is investigated, it goes back to joint supervisors for a final review. At that point, um, all the cases are sent to what is uh, the, referred to as Minneapolis Police Conduct Review Panel. Um, these panels are responsible for uh, review of um, completed investigations, all allegations that were made, and then in accordance with Minnesota State Statute, um, issue a recommendation of merit or no merit with regard to um, all of the allegations on a specific case. Uh, once that's completed, that case file is sent is then sent to MPD for review by the chief and any processes that are required in the MPD side um, for ultimately for a decisionary uh, or a disciplinary decision to be you know, uh, potentially made. Um, additionally, the other, the third part to our kind of structure of Minneapolis is the Police Conduct Oversight Commission, which is the public facing um, volunteer commission that we have in the city. Uh, they're responsible for review of um, I mean, public summary data, public, uh, you know, it could be summary case data, um, research and study reports, they work with our staff, uh, can make recommendations for possible areas of research and study. They also serve as a forum for uh, community input and for any you know, ideas that, you know, that that might feed into a research and study project as well. Um, I'm trying to think here, I'm to go back if I didn't cover anything here, but yeah, I mean, just in terms of the Office of Police Conduct Review, we have, uh, we have grown in recent years. Currently, we have two intake investigators, four investigators. Uh, we have two um, dedicated staff for body camera analysis. Um, one administrative support person, and then we have uh, an investigations manager and the director um, of the Office of Police Conduct Review itself. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's it's incredibly challenging work, you know, for our people, and we're very blessed to have a you know very dedicated staff, um, you know, that come in every day, you know, very passionate about the work. And so, I'm always happy to have the opportunity to share a little bit about what they do and you know the structure that we're currently utilizing. Obviously, you know, we're always trying to find areas, you know, areas to improve and continue to build this out, um, you know, as you know more tools uh, become available to us. But yeah, I'm more than happy to um, remain on for any questions that the committee might have. And I appreciate uh, you know the work that you're all doing on this important topic. Very well, thank you, uh, Mr. Hawkins. So very quickly, how, uh, how long has the office uh, been, um, um, how, long, how long since it has been established, I guess is the question. Uh, the Office of Police Conduct Review was established in 2012. Uh, prior to that, it was a civilian review authority that goes back to, I believe, 1990 or 1991. And Mr. Hawkins, what kind of uh, what kind of uh, uh, case law, for lack of a better uh, you know phrase, you know what what uh, you have a, a number of investigators, uh, light work, heavy work. Uh, what's the yeah. Um, I mean, again, I mean, with the range of complaints that we can get, I think it does vary, um, you know, in, in terms of, you know, some of them are going to be, you know, quite a big lift. Other ones might be, you know, simpler to resolve. As far as just, you know, OPCR handling 100% of the intakes, I mean, I can go back just historically with some numbers. I think before 2020, we were somewhere around 650 in terms of total complaints that were coming in that had that, that required intake investigation to determine if they're jurisdictional, if they're duplicates, if, you know, what the allegations are, you know, what uh, being made are, uh, identification of officers. And so that can, you know, again, that can range from a, you know, very simple, if you have a lot of information, to very challenging, if you have minimal information. 
that's also the stage at which you know the initial review of body camera happens to kind of help with some of the identification of you know who is on scene, you know what might have occurred. Um, and so I think yeah, in 2019, I believe it was around 650. In 2020, uh, we had 1,199 uh, complaints, and then I believe that did drop significantly last year. Uh, last year, down to about 371. And so currently, year to date, I think we're somewhere in the 30 uh, range for 2022 so far. Um, in terms of investigators, uh, the, I think ideally industry standard wise, the uh, workload for investigators is supposed to be around five cases. It's kind of what we shoot for. We've been well above that uh, for some time. I think right now we're uh, ranging between seven to nine uh, cases for our civilian investigators. And then I believe the last check in the IA investigators are somewhere um, either on par with that or slightly below. But um, but yeah, so it's uh, again, like I said, the volumes can you know can, can differ quite a bit. Obviously, you know it, events that you know attract a lot of attention attract a lot of complaints, um, and I think that's you know well reflected in 2020. Um, but yeah, it's the, the like I said, I wish I could have a more specific answer, but it really I mean the workload can vary yeah, quite that, a bit. That, that's very helpful. Mm -hmm. I, I, have there been any like recent trends or changes in the kind of of, of uh, cases that uh, you're looking at um, you know uh, conduct that you're reviewing uh, or has it been pretty steady you know uh, in terms of that over time I think it's it's generally remained fairly steady I mean the range of complaints that we are seeing does vary uh, kind of across the spectrum I think one of the changes we have noticed is just kind of I, I believe just comes from a more informed public um, and people that you know that just have a better awareness of this you know of this topic that are you know I think some of the complaints we're seeing are just you know like the, the level of detail and the manner in which the people are you know ensuring that they're going through and um, you know listing things in a very specific manner. I mean I, I think that's more of a recent trend that just comes from I think just an increased focus um, on this field. All right, very well. Well, thank you, Mr. Hawkins. I appreciate your testimony. If you could hang around uh, for a few minutes in case there's questions or comments. Uh, Absolutely. From, uh, I, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Next, Thank we you. have uh, uh, David Cullen, uh, Office of the Attorney General. I believe uh, uh, Attorney Cullen uh, is the um, attorney for our Pulse Board, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, um, uh, assigned from the Attorney General's office. Mr. Cullen, welcome to the committee. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair. Members, my name is Dave Cullen. I've served as an Assistant Attorney General at the Minnesota Attorney General's Office for the past 12 years, where, uh, as you mentioned, Mr. Chair, I manage the office's Health and Teacher Licensing Division. Uh, my division represents the 16 health-related licensing boards and the Professional Educator Licensing and Standards Board in litigation and administrative actions related to their licensure and regulatory oversight of healthcare providers and educators, my division also recently took on the advising attorney role for the post board. I appreciate the invitation to provide the committee with information about the investigative and complaint resolution process for the post board as uh, currently set forth in Minnesota statute section 214.10. I also appreciate the important work of the committee and your service to the public. I hope my comments uh, about the post board as it uh, compares to other licensing boards provides useful context for the committee and for your work at hand. The post board, like all occupational licensing boards, is subject to section 214.001, which as members likely know, provides among other things that the legislature finds that the interest of the state are served by the regulation of certain occupations that it is desirable for licensing boards to be composed primarily of members of the occupation so regulated and that procedural fairness in disciplining licensees requires a separation of the investigative and prosecutorial functions from the board's judicial responsibility. The post board is comprised of 17 members who are appointed to four-year terms by the governor. By statute, the board includes members of the general public, faculty and administration from peace officer education programs, members from county sheriffs, members from municipal police agencies, and the superintendent of the BCA. Like the health-related licensing boards, such as the boards of medical practice, nursing, dentistry, et cetera, and the professional education, educator licensing and standards boards, Pelsby, the post board is required under chapter 214 to receive and resolve complaints against its licensees that allege a violation of a statute or a rule which the board is empowered to enforce. The statutes uh, 
with respect to standards of conduct that the post board is currently empowered to enforce are set forth in sections 626.8431 and 0.8432 and the rules with respect to standards of conduct that the board is empowered to enforce are set forth in Minnesota rule 6700.1600. Now, section 214.10 subdivision 10 is unique to the post board in that it provides that when the post board receives a jurisdictional complaint, the executive director shall designate the appropriate law enforcement agency to conduct an inquiry into the allegations and submit a report to the executive director. Complaints and investigative findings are then reviewed by the Post Board's Complaint Investigation Committee, which is comprised of four members, including one public member. The committee, serving in an investigative and prosecutorial role, generally attempts to resolve jurisdictional complaints by way of a stipulation and proposed consent order for discipline, which can result in suspension or revocation of the license if the proposed order is adopted by the full board. If the board's complaint investigation committee cannot resolve the complaint by way of a stipulation for adoption by the full board, then the committee may convince a contested case action and proceed to an evidentiary hearing before an administrative law judge at the office of the administrative hearings. And my division and attorneys in this office uh, represent the board in that capacity. Uh, following the hearing, the administrative law judge will issue a report with findings of fact, conclusions of law, and a recommendation as to whether the board should take disciplinary action. It is up to the board to accept or reject the administrative law judge's findings, conclusions, and recommendation, and it is ultimately up to the board to decide whether to take disciplinary action, and if so, in what form. So the post board's investigatory process is similar to that of the Professional Educator Licensing and Standards Board in that Pelsby obtains investigative findings of teacher misconduct, primarily from the school district that employs or employed the teacher whose conduct is at issue pursuant to chapter 122A. The health related licensing boards, uh, however, use a different approach as provided specifically for health-related licensing boards in section 214.103 in that they refer, the health licensing boards refer uh, to the attorney general's office for field investigations, allegations of misconduct by healthcare providers. Uh, and again, that's pursuant to section 214.103. The attorney general's office's health and teacher licensing division has dedicated investigators who provide investigatory work for the health-related licensing boards pursuant to a legislative appropriation that helps fund the office's work for the health-related licensing boards. So in closing, there are some differences in the statutes that pertain to investigation of complaints for the post board, Pelsby, and the health-related licensing boards. That being said, the overall complaint resolution process is similar in that all licensing boards separate the investigative and prosecutorial work um, of their complaint review committees from the board's judicial responsibility of deciding whether to take disciplinary action, and if so, in what form. Indeed, by statute, a board member who is consulted during the course of an investigation uh, may participate in a contested case hearing, but may not vote on any matter pertaining to the case. Voting on whether, whether to impose discipline, and if so, in what form after a contested case hearing is left to the other remaining board members sitting in their judicial capacity. And finally, all board orders for discipline are subject to review by the Minnesota Court of Appeals if the licensee chooses to seek review. Uh, Mr. Chair, I thank you and members for your important work, for your public service, and for the invitation to join you today. I hope this information has provided helpful context and I'd be happy to answer any questions, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Cullen. It's, it's very helpful. I appreciate the uh, concise uh, walkthrough of the, um, you know, the, uh, the different approaches uh, that exist within uh, our licensing uh, structures uh, at the state, allowing us to be able to draw some um, contrast uh, among them, including uh, with the Pulse Board um, itself. 
uh, and I'm sure there there uh, there might be some well there might be some questions coming forward. So if you can stick around, I greatly appreciate that. Uh, finally, um, uh, members, we have uh, uh, Director Eric Missile of the Pulse Board. Director Missile. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the time and uh, uh, greet the members as I uh, talk very briefly. I will keep my my comments focused uh, with regard to Article Three of this bill. Um, and I appreciate the fact that um, Mr. Cullen was able to uh, provide additional insight into our um, process because that is going to be applicable to my to my comments in particular. Um, I, I, let me just say offhand that um, or right off the bat that I, I do not obviously speak on policy for the board that is up for the board to decide on on their general philosophy in terms of how they handle uh, these these matters that have been discussed today. Um, but I do uh, feel that I, I part of my role is to weigh in on the logistics and, and any concerns we have in terms of how we carry out a mission um, or statutory requirements. So to that end. Um, as I speak, as we speak about investigation, and there have been many comments on increasing the amount of investigation done by post um, and uh, increasing the breadth of, of what can be investigated by post, uh, by post um, my primary concern revolves around that. And in, in terms of uh, we do not know, and I, th and I found Mr. Uh, Hawkins' um, comments uh, apropos for this. We do not know what that's going to look like with the expansion of responsibility and um, scrutiny by the post board. Um, he identified his own agency, Minneapolis, as having anywhere from 650 to 1,200, if I if I heard him correctly, investigations, and that's one agency. So while we welcome the addition of the four um, investigators, which I know there's an appropriation in here for that, um, one of my concerns is that. Yeah, we don't know exactly what that would look like. And to that end, as, as a, a person and as a representative of the board where we want to be uh, not only transparent, but um, timely in our response to issues, I have concerns that <clears throat> we don't know what that's gonna look like and that will in, uh, result, could, could result in the post board like many other state agencies being subject to criticism because cases or uh, incidents that are reported sit for literally months and months or even years without resolution because there's just not enough uh, capacity to handle that. Now, one of the big issues that I, um, I, I feel needs to be addressed uh, if this expansion takes place um, is the issue of data practices. Um, as Attorney Cullen pointed out, for example, with Pelsby, the, the fact is that the um, school districts conduct the investigations and then supply the results of those investigations, including documentation, uh, interviews, other information directly to the board. I can tell you for post, that is not the case. We do not have a da data sharing statute like uh, many of the other boards do. Um, I am uh, currently crafting some uh, language to ask for that, and I'm working with our stakeholders in that regard, um, hopefully to take care of that during this session. But currently the problem we have, and I'll include, and Minneapolis is one of the agencies as an example, where we were conducting investigations, uh, asked for investigatory data on investigations they had done internally and were refused that data. Uh, under, the under the standpoint that it is 13.43 personnel data. And uh, again, because we do not have a data sharing statute, um, they right rightfully, based on their own counsel, not implying there's anything uh, uh, mischievous going on here, um, and based on advice of their own counsel, they were um, restricted from releasing that data to us. So that is a major uh, concern. Um, and again, it speaks to the issue of investigations and our ability to handle them, even with the addition of four investigators, because obviously if we have to actually go in and do the investigations and re-interview people and, and uh, vet them and all that sort of thing, uh, I suspect that's gonna be a very uh, large workload. Um, so that's uh, one part. The other piece of article three uh, that I'd like to speak to is the repealer and 
and I and I do again. I mentioned it yesterday. I appreciate uh, Representative Frazier's discussions with me on this. We've talked about it extensively, um, and um, I think um, we have a better understanding of maybe some of the concerns behind it, at least coming from my end. Um, but <clears throat> kind of uh, dovetailing with the issue of investigations, my concern with the repealing of those particular sections um, primarily revolves around one, uh, the ability to assign uh, and uh, order investigations being done by an appropriate agency for some of the reasons I just expressed, um, which are, um, you know, the workload and, and, um, and whatnot, but also from a data practices standpoint, quite honestly, if, if we are not able to resolve the data sharing uh, issue that POST has currently, then this statute will in fact become uh, important in terms of being able to have the agency order an agency to do an investigation on behalf of POST, at which point it is now our investigatory data. So um, I have concerns about that being removed. Um, the statute also provides for the, the makeup of the complaint investigation committee. Um, in fact, statute overrules rule right now. Our rule does not, um, it does not reflect statute, but we, we're in the process of making those changes. Um, and I think it's just important for us to maintain that discretion. Uh, as has been pointed out in front of this committee and many others, there are sections or parts where the post board does not have the authority that some other boards do have. And um, uh, I am uh, <clears throat> concerned about removing um, additional authority that we in fact already do have. Um, so with that, um, I will um, close my comments and again, thank you for the opportunity to speak on Article 3. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Director uh, Bissell. As I indicated earlier uh, this week, there, um, I mean, there are several uh, pieces here that you shared, um, uh, both capacity issues, but also, you know, some existing um, frameworks that exist in, in current law that uh, need to be answered, particularly the data sharing um, concerns that I had shared earlier, uh, my, my concern about that, because I had heard that from another angle uh, relative to local law enforcement uh, issues. Um, it sounds like um, something that um, uh, hopefully you and Representative Frazier and other committee members, you know, can work on. Uh, these are not simple uh, issues. I, I, I get that. Um, I'm, uh, we have about uh, eight minutes left. Uh, I'd, I'd like to uh, just ask a quick question of, of uh, Mr. Cullen from the uh, Attorney General's office. And you did speak to this um, at the very end, and I don't need a really long um, you know, answer here, uh, but it was important uh, to hear you know, the distinctive approaches uh, that are used by uh, our licensing boards and obviously you know, you have, you know, close proximity with our health and teacher and now with our um, peace officer um, uh, licensing board. Um, uh, Representative Fraser's bill in part gets at the issue of a board limiting its ability to act absent a conviction. Um, it seems to the chair that that's a pretty unique um, scenario. Um, and so I, the question is basically, uh, from your experience, is, is that in fact the case? So is that an unusual, is it unusual for a licensing board um, to limit its ability to act um, uh, absent a conviction for most of their, uh, acting for most of their standards uh, of, of conduct? Uh, thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. Members, that is different. Uh, uh, what well, you just described, Mr. Chair, then say, for example, the health-related licensing boards in Pelsby, uh, say, for example, Pelsby has a prohibition in their standards of conduct uh, prohibiting licensees from engaging in immoral character or conduct or willful neglect of their duties, um, and those certainly don't require a conviction. And then similarly, the health-related licensing boards by statute and by rule uh, prohibit certain conduct. Um, many of those prohibitions also do not involve uh, convictions. All right. Very well. Thank you, uh, Mr. Collin. Uh, I'll try to get in uh, as many as we can. Uh, Representative Pinto, we have not heard from you uh, this week, and you're on the list, and so let me call on you first. And what I confirmed was that, was that me, Mr. Chair? Yes. Representative oh, thank you. Just making sure. Thank you. Um, <laughs> 
I wanted to uh, simply uh, uh, just note uh, uh, briefly, and this is um, this is kind of going back to the comments from Representative Grossel earlier. Um, he had um, said that, in his view, anyway, um, that there are crime concerns that are that are focused on on the particular cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul, um, and also referenced um, the victims uh, being um, communities of color. And I guess I just wanted to to make sure to emphasize then. Um, just as if there was a, an issue that some of us felt was focused in, in, in Clearbrook, where he represents. Um, we probably look particularly to him uh, for some leadership on that. Um, we happen to have a number of members, including you, Mr. Chair, who represents uh, the cities of, uh, of Minneapolis and St. Paul. If that's where he believes that there's a, uh, a need to focus, I think that we can have some answers uh, coming out of those communities. And if it's communities of color that um, represent Grossel and others believe uh, are areas that are particularly victimized, um, well, then I certainly think that we want to be looking to our legislators of color um, for leadership on that, as indeed we are. Um, and so I guess I want to just just kind of wanted to note in response to some of those questions. And by the way, that is not to say that the rest of us are on the sidelines at all. Um, but, and I do think that it's important um, that we recognize um, uh, that we're looking to communities for solutions. Um, I spent time in the minority my first four years, um, and I know the challenges that my um, colleagues uh, in the majority have often heard me talking about that and the need to make sure we hear all voices. And you, Mr. Chair, um, I'm so grateful to you for doing that. And so I kind of want to reassure um, Representative Grossel um, that this is this process, as you were pointing out earlier, Mr. Chair, where we're hearing all voices. Um, and I do think it's especially important um, to be hearing from those who are in communities that uh, Representative Grossel and others have said um, that he believes are particularly affected. That's all I want to say. Thanks so much. I appreciate that. And speaking uh, to that, uh, Representative Jean. Representative Jean. Hi, I, I forgot to mute myself. No, I just want to say that uh, Representative Pinto already reiterated some of the things I want to say. So, in uh, light of uh, in uh, time here, I will just uh, uh, pass up on this opportunity to speak. Uh, but I want to. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Chair Mirani and uh, Vice Chair Frazier for bringing the work uh, that we are doing here uh, is going to be very essential, especially with a, lot, with a lot that's been going on here in the community. So I appreciate both your leadership. Um, thank you very much. Uh, we have three minutes left, so I'm going to uh, kind of default uh, uh, by virtue of little time to uh, Representative Johnson, our, our lead. Um, and I want to make sure we have enough time for me to uh, make the motion to lay the bill uh, on the table. So, Representative Johnson. Uh, Chair Mariani, members, um, I want to remind uh, everybody that uh, law enforcement is different than every other licensed profession in the state of Minnesota that the state licensed. Unlike doctors, nurses, dentists, barbers, uh, physical therapists, uh, even the people that do the do the do your nails. A law enforcement officer can only get a license and have an active license when he is actually working for a state agency, whether it's a county, city, and it uh, could be a township, the state. That's the only time they can have an active license where they can actually practice law. Lawyers can practice law in private practice. That's why it's it's different. Well, you actually have to be hired as an officer in order to be able to use your license. Now, well, that's one big difference. Uh, and I also want to uh, bring up the fact that, uh, Chair Mariani, over the last three years, you have put a lot of money towards public safety. Unfortunately, a lot of that money that I believe and members on my side was misprioritized. And where it was in the right places, there was a lot of strings attached with policies that could actually be detrimental to the safety of the public and has actually attacked the great profession of law enforcement. Do we have bad, bad actors here and there? Absolutely. We do our best to get them out. But it's not up to post board to do that. That is up to the chiefs and the sheriffs and the administration in the cities to do proper paperwork and, and have their documentation in line so that proper disciplinary action can be taken. We've heard that uh, Minneapolis has had a civilian review style board since the 1990s. And 
from what I see, it's not working very well. Those that don't have that and the chiefs and the sheriffs that take the responsibility to do their duties and their responsibilities for the, to make sure that their officers are acting properly and are accountable, they've done a good job. We just have a few, pretty much just one department that has it. So with that, uh, we're, I know we're running out of time. Uh, there's some more questions I did have for Mr. Hawks and uh, Mr. Collins, but uh, we will take that up at another time if we have the opportunity. And with that, I'll let you, uh, Chair Mariani, finish up today because I see we're past the 12 o'clock hour. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Um, and to, to be continued, um, I do want to uh, continue to invite on behalf of Representative Frazier, um, uh, members to engage uh, with him um, uh, to continue to shape this bill. Um, uh, I know his door is open and my door is open as well. We've reached out to uh, broad stakeholders, including uh, conventional law enforcement, but also the community groups uh, most impacted um, in public safety. Um, and so I think that that really is... I think the ch chair, if you can hear us, you, your video is frozen. This is the most effective. Did I freeze out, Representative Frazier? You, yeah. you did. Okay. Yes, you did. <laughs> well, you know what, then? I'm not going to repeat it only because uh, we're over time. Representative Fraser, quick uh, comments, and then uh, we're going to move your... Um, yeah, just, just quickly, and, and, and you know, just quickly to the last point that uh, Rep. Johnson made. You know, as a state legislator, our job is to protect uh, our Constitution and make sure those rights are um, protected for, our, uh, for Minnesotans. And anytime we have uh, any of our actors, law enforcement, on behalf of our states, infringing upon that, we have to take action. Uh, we've seen in the recent days, there's been an infringement on the Second Amendment um, and the right to be free from certain searches. So we have to make sure that the state actors, as elected officials, that we take the action necessary to protect Minnesotans. And that's what we're doing. That's what this bill is for. So thank you, Chair. Thank you, Representative Frazier. Members, uh, to be continued, please reach out to Representative Frazier uh, and to myself. We'll continue to work on this. Um, and uh, at this point, the chair is going to lay House File 2724 uh, on the table. We'll bring this back up. Uh, and members, uh, we will uh, adjourn at a regular time, or rather we will convene at our regular time uh, next Tuesday. Until then, have a, a good uh, warm weekend um, and come prepared for uh, good debate and good work uh, next week. This committee stands adjourned.